has been less critical of China, for example, than many other regional powers. China is Indonesia's largest trading partner, has built high-profile infrastructure there, and is a major investor in its nickel industry, an industry that's really central to Indonesia's future economic plans. Jokowi has also stepped up Indonesia's diplomatic role globally. For example, last year, he made a high-profile effort for peace in Ukraine, and he's one of the few global leaders to have met with Xi, Biden, Putin, and Zelensky. Indonesia has also maintained open diplomacy with Iran and been critical of some of America's big Asian security initiatives, like AUKUS, the partnership that ties the US, UK, and Australia more closely together militarily. So what is Washington missing when we look at Indonesia? How hard will it be to keep Indonesia out of China's orbit? Is trade liberalization maybe the answer? And if not, what are the other options? With me today to tackle these questions are two of the world's top experts on U.S.-Indonesia relations. Ambassador Scott Marcial, who is the Oxenberg Rowland Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University, and a former U.S. ambassador to both Indonesia and ASEAN. He is the author of a new book on U.S. statecraft toward the region called Imperfect Partners. I also have Professor Dewi Fortuna Anwar, who straddles the world of academia, political activism, and government. She is currently research professor at the National Research and Innovation Agency in Indonesia and has served as a senior advisor to the Indonesian president and vice president, among other government posts. She joins us from Jakarta. Thanks to you both for being here. Pleasure. Nice to meet you. Scott, I'd like to start with you uh, to give us a little bit of an overview of how you see America's interests in Indonesia. Why does Indo Indonesia matter to the United States? And when our most senior foreign policy officials think about Indonesia, what should they have at the top of their minds? Yeah. Well, Indonesia is hugely important for the United States and for the world and, and certainly for uh, Southeast Asia and the Asia Pacific, partly for the reasons you mentioned at the outset, Chris, um, the size, the world's fourth largest country, third largest uh, democracy. It also is home to the world's largest uh, Muslim population. Um, and, and I don't like to emphasize the Muslim aspect, but that is certainly a factor. It's got a big and growing economy with tremendous potential. And it's a big player in the region and increasingly internationally. So the U.S. interest, you know, Indonesia has always been, since independence, very non-aligned. So from my perspective, the U.S. strategic interest is not in trying to, quote, win over Indonesia in some way to be aligned with the United States. That's just not going to happen. But rather, our interest is in Indonesia continuing to be successful, you know, stable, peaceful, democratic, more prosperous and playing a constructive role in the region. And as much as possible, we'd like Indonesia to work with us on you know, regional diplomacy, economics, trade and investment, the environment, climate change, because Indonesia is a huge player uh, in the environment. Um, so building up that partnership. I think when we look at the U.S.-Indonesian relationship, a lot of people like to say that it's, it's kind of underperformed expectations uh, that may be true to, to an extent. Um, there's just some, some fundamental differences in views about certain issues, certainly uh, approaches toward the Middle East. Um, but also, I think the one area of biggest weakness I see in the relationship is in the economy. The trade and investment relationship is, is not performed nearly as well as, as I think it could. And so I hope that that will be a priority going forward. Well, there's a lot there to, uh, to dig into. But um, before we do, David, let me turn to you. And, and I'm interested uh, in your thoughts about um, what American interests in Indonesia are. But I'm also interested in your thoughts about how U.S. policy is perceived and has been viewed in recent years from where you sit in Jakarta. Yeah, uh, I mean, the U.S. interests in Southeast Asia and Indonesia being you know, one of the largest country, in fact, the largest country in South Asia, is, as you've mentioned, is geopolitics, geoeconomics, geostrategy. Geopolitics, you know, it's Southeast Asia has always been at the center of major power rivalry. You know, the Cold War was very hot. You know, one of the America's deadliest war 
where thousands of young Americans died in, in Southeast Asia. And uh, Indonesia was very key, you know, the, um, uh, Indonesia was not part of the uh, ally, alliance against uh, um, the uh, communism or, or against capitalism, it's always been non-aligned. But the US was, of course, you know, very keen to ensure that Indonesia was not one of the dominoes that fell during the, uh, the, the, the communist uh, takeover of uh, Indochina. Just strategically, you know, there are so many flashpoints in the region, the South China Sea, you know, this being, being a major point, you know, there's critical areas for uh, navigation. Important choke points have to come through Indonesian waters, Indonesia being the largest. Uh, archipelago. There's the geoeconomics. Indonesia has always been rich in natural resources. There's been huge American investment in the past in oil and gas and mining. You know, uh, America was the, the, the number one player. It still has a major uh, economy interest. Freeport is still, you know, uh, American uh, own uh, com a company in, 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 in Papua. So all of this, you know, are of major importance for for South, uh, for for the United States, but I think we have to go back, uh, Scott. You know, the shadow of history remains looms large in the region, including in uh, South, in Indonesia. So Indonesia's relations with the United States have always been a bit difficult. There's been a lot of frustrations from both sides, a lot of love and hate relationship uh, throughout the 50s. You know, uh, when when the U.S. tried to prevent Indonesia from leaning too close to communist countries, to leaning too close to China. Uh, Sukarno, you know, told the U.S. to go to hell with his aid. <laughs> and, and, uh, and in fact, you know, and that is because of domestic politics. And it, Indonesia, in fact, entered into near a near alliance with China. And then uh, uh, it swung uh, and to become anti-China. Uh, uh, and closer to the United States. So when we are talking now about global competitions, uh, US-China rivalry, for, from where I sit, you know, there's a sense of deja vu. We've been there, you know, we've been here before. You know, this, uh, this seems to be uh, uh, back, uh, our history seems to be uh, going back in circle. And so Indonesia is trying to position itself to ensure its strategic autonomy while trying to engage, you know, in the end of the Cold War, uh, I think it is the only time that we can really do our free and active foreign policy. Because as you can see, during the Cold War, Sukarno tilted too far to the left. Suharto was seen to be tilting too far to the right. So it was, you know, it's not, uh, it's not really strategic autonomy at the time. Uh, Indonesia not, not being, an, uh, uh, you know, with its free and active foreign policy, in fact, be became a de facto ally with the United States. So, right, most of the, uh, you know, the later part of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the Cold War. So now, you know, what Indonesia is trying to do, Chris, is you know, it's trying to take advantage of what China has to offer in terms of, you know, investment, it's large market and so on. But Indonesia would not be comfortable of becoming too dependent on any one country. Uh, for a long time, for decades, Indonesia has been very dependent on Japan for infrastructure development, for example. So now if you're seeing competition uh, for infrastructure development, it's not US against China, it's more or less giving also Japan a bit of, you know, some competition with China coming in. Uh, but at the same time, Indonesia is also very uncomfortable uh, with what China is doing, particularly in the South China Sea, uh, which also impinge, impinges on Indonesia's exclusive economic zone uh, north of Natuna. So at the same time, you can really see Indonesia is not just maintaining strategic autonomy in the classic non-aligned stance of being equidistant uh, or trying to be neutral. No, that's not the case. It's also trying to get the United States to be more engaged economically again. But at the same time, it's really beefing up. The U.S.-Indonesia uh, bilateral military exercises have gone up. The Garuda Shield exercise, for example, have gone up from bilateral to become much multilateral, uh, from just a few thousand to, you know, large numbers of people uh, involving many countries now. So what you see is Indonesia, and like other many countries in the region, are doing hedging, uh, taking advantage, maximizing benefits, but mitigating risks, uh, you know, when in the face of China rise. But the, uh, Scott, when you said that you didn't want to overemphasize Indonesia being the Muslim majority country, 
that matters a lot, actually, because the U.S. being a global player, how Jakarta perceives the U.S. policy is not just about what the U.S. does towards Indonesia or what the U.S. does in the region, but also what the U.S. does globally, particularly towards uh, you know Muslim countries. The issue is uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, you know uh, problems remains one of the stumbling block of uh, really warm relations between Jakarta and Washington. Uh, during the, the Bush period, you know, the uh, Indonesia opposed the unilateral uh, uh, invasion of, of Iraq. And, and it's always been very critical that the war on terror was considered to be, you know, more about war against Muslims and Islamic, Islam xenophobia, and that affects Indonesia as a whole. So whatever the U.S. does, in the Middle East or in Afghanistan, that also affects Indonesia directly. And during, of course, during the war on terror, after the Middle East, Southeast Asia uh, was in fact the, you know, the most important battlefront uh, when countering you know, violence, extremism. So there are a lot of complex issues uh, in, you know, in how Jakarta uh, perceives Washington and also in how Washington <laughs> perceives Jakarta. David, that's that's fascinating. You've laid also laid a number of things on the table that I want to dig into. But Scott, let me let me just go right back to you with that. I mean, I, I think um, um, you know the idea that American global policy is uh, at least as important uh, in some ways in um, shaping the trajectory of U.S. Indonesia relations is an interesting point. I mean, how do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, Dewey's absolutely right, of course, that that does shape how a lot of Indonesians view the United States, uh, particularly our policy in the Middle East toward the Arab-Israeli issue, uh, more more broadly, uh, perceptions of U.S. treatment of Muslims uh, when I was ambassador, and that was you know 2010 to 2013. I talked to any number of people who said, you know, we have trouble with how the U.S., we think the U.S. is discriminating or doesn't like Islam, these sorts of things. So that's a that's been a real challenge, uh, certainly in the relationship and uh, one that that we have to understand and recognize. And Indonesians are going to continue to speak out about that. And it, it does uh, certainly affect the relationship. As, uh, similarly, um, the U.S. may not be happy at times with um, certain policies that Indonesia takes uh, internationally, uh, maybe a little too willing to engage with Russia right now. Um, you know, in contrast to the criticism of the U.S. about treatment of Muslims, sort of mute on China's treatment of the Uyghurs. Um, so it goes both ways, but I do think it's a bigger issue in terms of Indonesian perceptions of the U.S. than it is of U.S. perceptions of Indonesia. I think, Dewi, could you explain a little bit about why at least in Washington, we have the view sometimes that, um, and this is also true of other countries like Turkey, and there are other countries that we could think of, that some countries will be critical of American policy in the Middle East, but then give China a, a pass when it comes to uh, Xinjiang and the Uyghurs. Why, why, why is it that we have that perception? And to what extent is that actually true? Uh, for, for Indonesia, if you go back to the history, uh, if you, in 1955, Indonesia hosted the first Asian African conference, uh, the Bandung conference. There, the issue of Palestinian independence was, you know, the self-determination Palestine state was already one of the agenda. Besides the uh, uh, fight for independence of other countries in Asia and Africa. And up to now, most all the other countries have regained their statehood, except the Palestinian issue. So for the Indonesian government, the issue of self-determination of, you know, of, of uh, uh, the Palestinian people uh, remains an unfinished homework. So for, for the Indonesian government, it is not a religious issue. It's more, you know, it's a, this is an unfinished uh, self-determination issue. But for the majority of Indonesian population, for the Muslim, it's a re religious sentiment that, you know, they are, that these are the, Daily, you, they see persecutions. Uh, Palestinians, uh, when uh, you know the, the 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 reaction of the Israelis, the occupation of the West Bank, the discrimination to the Palestinian people. You know, this is something that they feel very strongly about. So, Islam is not usually um, a key factor in Indonesia's foreign policy. 
But when it comes to the Palestinian issue, it, has, it always has been one of the aspect that it has a veto power. So Indonesia still does not recognize Israel, does not have diplomatic relations with Israel up till now, you know, since, since that time. Because this is one area, any, uh, you know, any government initiative that says, you know, we'll have recognized Israel, it will go down very badly, including, for example, the, uh, you know, this under, uh, is it under uh, 18 or, you know, this young uh, football soccer clubs uh, uh, where that included an Israeli team. Uh, two governors, one from Bali, who's not, you know, who's not a Muslim, and one from Central, uh, Central Java, Uganda, who's not considered to be an Islamist. These two governors refused to host, uh, to allow the Israeli team to come. And, and people say, now, why are they doing that? Because these are not seen to be Islamists, you know. But don't forget, they both come from PDIP, yeah. which is a Sukan, you know, the remnant of Sukarno's party, the Nationalist Party. And this, you know, this is, they have a very strong position on that. So it's a very now, central why, issue for historical yeah, reasons. Yeah, yeah. No. yeah. So, that, so that's why, so why for the Zinjab issue? Well, um, I want to be cynical about it in a way that, because there are not exactly a lot of, news on CNN or BBC about what actually happened in Xinjiang because, you know, you're, the world media does not free, have free access to that region, mm -hmm. you know, so you do not really see, you know, uh, you're not confronted uh, uh, daily of uh, what conflicts are because it's very controlled. China has also been very adept at engaging uh, uh, Muslim organizations in Indonesia. They broke leaders from the Nat Rama and so on, you know, uh, to that part. And I can also tell you that uh, they have been very active also. Uh, China has very, very been very active in establishing Chinese cent study centers in Islamic institutions, universities, not in main uh, universities, uh, not like Universitas Indonesia or, you know, that, that big universities. But they've been very uh, careful, selective. Some of the smaller Islamic uh, universities, you know, that, that establish uh, Chinese studies there, and, and so they have been very good at uh, when you call public public diplomacy, mm -hmm. and, and it seems to have paid off. Uh, you know, there, there's lack of um, publicity about it worldwide, uh, and also active pu uh, public diplomacy uh, by by Beijing. By Beijing. Mm -hmm. No, that's very interesting. Let, let me let me just step back a, a little bit here, and I want to go again to the broader question of <laughs> Indonesia's relationship with China. Scott, I, I think in you, it was implicit, at least, uh, in what you said a few minutes ago, that there is a risk of Indonesia drifting uh, more and more into China's orbit. Do you see that actually happening uh, over the course of the last few years, or is this something that American policy makers need to guard against? Um, I'm not too worried about Indonesia drifting into anyone's orbit. Uh, Indonesia is really proudly independent, and it also is far enough away from China and has the mass in terms of size, population, economy to to stand up for itself and resist any any um, excessive gravitational pull. That doesn't mean that Indonesia won't work closely with China on things like infrastructure, as Dewi said, it absolutely will. But I'm not really worried about Indonesia uh, drifting into the Chinese orbit. And from a U.S. perspective, even if we were worried about that, um, the, the, the thing to do is not go to Indonesia and say China's bad, which sometimes mm -hmm. American politicians are tempted to do. It's not a helpful approach. We should be focused on what we're doing and how we can build a relationship with Indonesia. And the same goes for the rest of Southeast Asia. None of these countries want to be vassal states of anyone else. They all want their independence, their strategic autonomy, as Dewey said. So we, we need to have some confidence and trust in them and focus instead on, on being a good partner. And I think, you know, when we look at the U.S.-Indonesian relationship, there's a lot of positives. This is not a, this is not a bad relationship. Um, there, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of business. There's a lot of diplomacy. There's a lot of people-to-people -people ties. But it's not as good as it could be. Um, and uh, I think strengthening the economic side, continuing to strengthen the education side, 
Um, the environment side, I mentioned earlier, Indonesia is one of the world's largest emitters. The U.S. and Japan are leading a G7 effort working with Indonesia on this so-called Just Energy Transition Partnership to help Indonesia shift, uh, accelerate its shift from coal to cleaner energy. And it's crunch time for that partnership to work. So the U.S. needs to show that it and its partners can deliver and do their part on that. So it's, it's you know, working with Indonesia, recognizing there's going to be some differences here and there. Um, that should be the focus rather than worrying so much about what China's doing. That's a, that's a really uh, interesting uh, framing. Can you talk maybe just a little bit more about what we might do to deepen the economic relationship? Yeah, the economic relationship's been a, a struggle for um, some time. Um, I mean, I see, I just looked at the trade numbers this morning and, and they have gone up the last few years after being relatively stagnant for a while, still around $35, $40 billion of bilateral trade, um, which is not very much for two very big countries. Um, uh, and uh, my argument would be, and they, we may disagree, you know, Indonesia is been relatively protectionist uh, for a lot of years. It has sort of a protectionist default, which I've always thought may be partly the legacy of being colonized by a, a Dutch company. It <laughs> caused a lot of long-term, you know, um, uh, ambivalence about, about dealing with uh, Western companies. Um, and investment, there's significant U.S. investment a lot of it, as Dewey said, has been in the resource, natural resource sector, which is good, but it's also a sensitive spot for Indonesia. So I think there's opportunities to do more in, again, clean energy technology. There's a, there's a thriving star, uh, startup uh, market in, in Indonesia. There's a lot of opportunity, but um, it's, it's been tough to break through. When I was there, the biggest issues we faced really on a government to government level were over trade and barriers to trade. Davey, what's your reaction to that? I mean, what would you put at the top of the list of ways to strengthen U.S.-Indonesia relations? Would it be economics and trade or would it be something else? Well, you know, the, Indonesia and the U.S. has sign already a comprehensive strategic partnership that covers everything under the sun, you know, there's mm -hmm. politics and security, there's uh, economic, there's technology, there's people to people, maritime cooperation and so on. Mm -hmm. On the political, sec on the security side, you know, uh, Indonesia, of course, doesn't want to become over dependent on the US again for its military procurement, because uh, Indonesia mm -hmm. suffered from US embargoes and sanctions. <clears throat> Uh, over the East Timor issue, and that you know that let re that really uh, uh, undermined Indonesia's uh, uh, defense capability. So Indonesia is keen to get the best uh, technology transfer from whatever countries uh, that that it offers, you know. But clearly, it still wants to go to buy some of the U.S. as well. I think it's in fact it's already procuring that, and uh, in, uh, the U.S. has again, uh, you know has restored military to military relations with Indonesia. So a lot of Indonesian uh, military officers, you know, they, they get their uh, training from the United States. That was stopped for a while after the, uh, the East Timor uh, 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 crisis. Uh, but on the economy, it can be deeper. Uh, mm -hmm. as, as Scott mentioned, it's mostly in the extractive sector. Uh, and usually extractive sectors are in, in remote areas. They do not really generate a lot of employment opportunities either. Uh, you know, that's very limited. And also there's, uh, the duration is quite limited. For example, the mobile oil used to be very big in uh, gas uh, in, in Aceh, uh, which also became a source of conflict, you know, with, with the free Aceh movement. Uh, but now the gas is no more. So uh, if the U.S. can come, uh, to offer, you know, this green economy, this blue economy, that there's a lot of opportunities because the U.S. is, of course, quite advanced in technology there. Mm -hmm. uh, but coming back to China, you know, regardless, uh, most Indonesians, uh, for the U.S., you know, the worries about the geopolitics, the geostrategic issues, uh, you know, what China is doing, the South China Sea and, and, and so on. Uh, what about what it does to freedom of navigation? But I've written an article on this in China, uh, Indonesia-China relations coming full circle. Most Indonesian people 
are less concerned about geopolitics, geosecurity. They are more concerned about their own internal economic livelihood. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the China has always been a problem. Relations with China is not just a foreign policy issue for Indonesia. It's always been part of domestic politics. So we have to be very careful about that. Because every time, because you know, as you know, the largest uh, overseas Chinese are in Southeast Asia. And they are very influential economically. Uh, during the colonial periods, they were used as uh, middlemen, uh, as uh, you know, the, the the class that extracted taxes, uh, they, they controlled the trade. So they often became targets, you know, rather than attacking the Dutch or attacking the British uh, or attacking the Spaniards. You know, the local Chinese tended to be the vulnerable targets, and they have suffered massacres and you know uh, a lot of unpleasantness throughout centuries and it happened again you know at the end of this uh, new order period when Suharto the Suharto regime fell down anti-Chinese riots in Indonesia so we have to be careful you know about not having this anti-China hysteria because it's always conf- got conflated with domestic politics as well uh, and so in Indonesia uh, this remains suspicions you know because China was accused of supporting the Communist Party in Indonesia uh, that, you know, led to the death of several generals, you know, that led, in fact, uh, that was that triggered the, the fall of the, the, the Sukarno government and the rise of the very anti-communist uh, military uh, regime. Uh, and uh, the suspicions, you know, everything to do with China and Chinese, as you know, uh, were totally forbidden throughout the, the Suharto period. We, Indonesia froze diplomatic relations with China between 68 and 1990. Did not even allow Chinese scripts on ketchup bottles coming to Indonesia. The Faisal Economic Review, the magazines, even the Traveler's Tales, you know, it's got Chinese characters, it would be absolutely blackened. So that was totally bad. Indonesia only normalized relations again with China in 1990. But while the uh, economy is going very steadily, there are concerns about the impacts to uh, Indonesian workers. Uh, there's a lot of criticism, for example, there a lot of Chinese investment also bring in not just white collar workers, but also blue collar workers. Now, if investment from Europe or from the United States, from Japan, of course, it doesn't make sense for them to bring their own, uh, you know, blue collar workers, it's too expensive. They would only bring uh, the higher level and they would train local people to be mid-level managers. And, and then all the lo- workers will be local. But the Chinese company do, do not build, do not operate in that way. They, they design the, pro- uh, the projects, they bring their own workers, you know, and they, they build it. So there's a lot of criticisms that, you know, that's less uh, uh, of the multiply effects from Chinese uh, uh, investment. So is that difference, of- D- D- Dewey, is that difference well understood between the yeah, benefits yeah, of yeah, Western yeah, as yeah. opposed to Chinese? So, there, so there's a lot of, Hoax news, in fact, before 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 uh, the last presidential elections. In fact, Prabowo, uh, uh, General Prabowo, you know, who is now in the government as Minister of Defense, uh, one one of the issue that he raised, for example, you know, and that the parties that criticized President Jokowi don't we don't know for being too close to China, was that they allowed an influx of millions of Chinese workers to Indonesia, which is not true, of course, you know. Mm-hmm. But the fact of the matter is that you know that there are uh, workers from China. They are not in large numbers, but that is the business deals that Indonesia signed. So this remains a very sensitive issue uh, with, uh, with Indonesia. When, for example, oh. yeah, so when Indonesia joined the ASEAN-China free trade arrangement, <sighs> Indonesia was not really well prepared for the influx of Chinese manufactured products and agricultural products. So there was huge demonstrations uh, when the ASEAN-China uh, uh, free trade uh, agreement came into effect into around 2011 the huge demonstrations on the streets of jakarta wanting uh, asking the government to revoke that because the, uh, you know it's very difficult now to find indonesian fruits in the supermarket uh, fuji apples and oranges from china are much cheaper than oranges from medan or kalimantan so you know so uh, are we because of indonesia's poor connectivity uh, shippings within the islands sometimes are less efficient and more expensive. So imports from China are flooding the markets. Even batiks, you know, the uh, bat- printed batiks from China. So there's a concerns of, you know, too much exposure 
uh, of Chinese economy. So for the domestic constituents, it's about the impact of Chinese economic penetration uh, that they worry about. And of course, you know, Indonesia, again, it's being the world's largest Muslim nation, being a communist is anathema. <laughs> you know, China is still seen, you know, is, is capitalist now, it's still a communist uh, system. So for the majority of Indonesians, you know, that doesn't go well. Uh, you know, it could, we do not have the same values. So uh, we can have very good cooperation, but we have different values and there are also concerns, you know, as I said, about the social economy. I think a lot of what you're saying, Dewi, really supports um, what Ambassador Marcial was saying about the likelihood that Indonesia will remain uh, independent and autonomous in its foreign policy, given the cultural uh, factors that you just laid out, as well as the economic ones. Um, this is Pivotal States uh, with the American Statecraft Program at the Carnegie Endowment. And this is the time when we start to go to questions um, from our, um, our audience here. Um, we already have a few coming in, uh, and they are about ASEAN, which uh, I think we should probably, given the events that are going on today, spend some time talking about. Um, so we've got one uh, right here uh, on President Biden's decision not to attend the ASEAN summit. A lot of people have been talking about this. I mentioned it in my opening comments. Um, let me ask you, uh, Scott, can, can, can you give us your view on this? Um, you know, is this uh, a sign of America's lack of interest in Southeast Asia? Um, or, or, or if not, how should we read it? Um. First, I'm someone who's who's always argued very strongly that that U.S. presidents should attend these summits. I think it's really important to show up consistently. Um, that said, uh, a couple of things. One, uh, President Biden and his team have engaged with Southeast Asia very uh, substantively and consistently uh, since they took office. Um, two, I mean, President Biden's going to Vietnam, which is an ASEAN member, uh, instead of going to Indonesia. I mean, arguably, he could have gone to both. But then with the G20 summit in between, it would have been a very long trip and, and not really viable. So personally, I, I wish he were going. But I think you see very steady and consistent and substantive U.S. engagement with Southeast Asia uh, during this administration. And I think that helps a lot. People will still be disappointed that he didn't go and that he sent the vice president. The other point I would make is, you know, Xi Jinping has sent his deputy every year and nobody says anything about that. Mm -hmm. um, part of that is because China is clearly engaged in the region all the time. So people don't doubt China's interest. The problem with the U.S. president not showing up is not just not showing up, but not showing up combined with failing to be engaging with the region. I think at this point, uh, the U.S. is engaging quite well with Southeast Asia, but they we can, can disagree. But my experience with Southeast Asians, they want to see consistent engagement over a period of years. And then if the president misses an occasional meeting, that's acceptable. But there is an argument that China is sort of overwhelming the United States with its presence in many countries uh, in the region, diplomatic, economic, uh, and, and, and otherwise. Is that, is that true or is that just not the case? Um, I, I wouldn't say overwhelming. I mean, in the U.S. diplomatic presence, China's diplomatic presence, I think they're, they're I don't know the exact numbers, they're probably pretty similar. Certainly China's become a bigger uh, economic player and a bigger trade partner, although the U.S. remains you know, very, very large export market. Uh, so China's very active. But again, I, I don't think it's a matter of having to match, you know, you right. know investment for investment or scholarship for scholarship. Uh, again, given that Southeast Asian countries want to be autonomous, want to be independent, want to have good relations with both countries, it's not so much matching China as making sure that the U.S. is doing all that it can to be a very good and reliable partner. Really interesting point. Dewi, how about you? Um, what do you think about President Biden's decision not to go? And, and also, what are other people saying about it in Jakarta? Uh, since I'm no longer the government, I can be as blunt as I like. Uh, and, and, and I'm frankly, I'm very disappointed. Uh, you know, because the, the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, the, the key word is reliability being a reliable partner. And we've, through the Trump administration, uh, 
ASEAN was clearly not considered that important because throughout the Trump administration, uh, the United States did not even appoint uh, the ambassador to uh, ASEAN. So it's, you know, that the, 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 the position remained vacant and, and he, and uh, President Trump attended the East Asia summit once. And then after that, he gave it a miss, you know, uh, for the entire duration of the administration. So there's a huge expectation when the Biden administration came, uh, you know, that uh, talk about uh, uh, support for ASEAN centrality and that continue, you know, like more like Obama 2.0, you know, uh, really close again, uh, that the US is going to be engaged again. Uh, so there's a lot of expectations. Um, and in the first year, it went up, you know, the, 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 uh, there's a lot of uh, people quite happy, but they're still waiting for it. Uh, so when Biden, when President Biden said that he is not coming for Indonesia as a chair of ASEAN, it is very disappointing because usually the ASEAN summit comes later in the year. Usually, you know, the first summit, which is just for ASEAN members, will be earlier in the year. And this was held, you know, what, well, I think it was earlier, in, in, it was held in May, was it? Uh, or April or May. And then usually the next one will be in late October or November. The Indonesian government brings the summit forward to early September to make it possible for leaders who are attending the G20 also to come, you know, to come to ASEAN meetings first. So you can imagine, you know, that it's Indonesia, I suppose, is trying to rush a lot of this uh, agenda and bring it together uh, uh, and bring it forward at least two months early. Uh, and after all that, President Biden still doesn't come. But if he only goes to India, to G20, uh, and, and then he has to rush back home, uh, maybe people say, you know, it's okay. But to add insult to injury, you know, he's going to Vietnam, but missing Jakarta, suppo you know, supposed to be in uh, Indonesia, is the largest member of ASEAN, re regarded uh, as, uh, you know, the uh, natural leader. And the, you know, I mean, that Indonesia is in fact bending backward, you know, in terms of the timing. So yes, we are disappointed. It doesn't mean that Vice President Harris is not welcome, that she's not going to be uh, substantively very, you know, very solid in leading the, uh, the US team. But the, the fact of the matter is that, you know, uh, it's like, you know, we don't think Indo ASEAN is that important when we don't think that Jakarta is that important. You know, that is that sense. We think that so, US... So here's the, here's, the, here's, the, here's the question then. From an American perspective, um, Scott, why does ASEAN matter? I think this is, you know, something that someone like you, you were the ambassador to ASEAN, but I mean, when you had to explain it to people, and I'm not just talking about around the State Department, but I mean more broadly than that, I mean, why should American citizens care that their president goes to a meeting like this? Yeah, I think there's a couple of reasons. I mean, ASEAN is not, you know, this bold, incredibly dynamic um, international organization. Not that there's a lot of bold, interna dynamic international organizations to begin with. It's it's cautious. It's consensus based. The meetings themselves are, frankly, you know, often rather dull. Um, although you, th there's a lot of side meetings that are very important at these meetings. But to me, the main thing about ASEAN is is it's really important for the ten member countries that together constitute almost 700 million people or represent 700 million people and collectively would be the world's fifth largest economy. It's a really important institution for all of them. And it has helped do its primary job. It's done very well, which is keeping peace among those 10 countries. and, and Which is in America. America's interest, no question about it. Very much in America's interest. Yeah. And going to those meetings, one, you end up having a lot of important meetings, bilateral meetings and small meetings that are very valuable, even if the central plenary meeting, if you will, is not that exciting. But two, you're, it's kind of to, to put it in simple terms, you know, what we used to say, it's a 10 for one. You go to one place and you're, you're, you're paying respect to an institution that's important to all 10 countries. And that helps your relationship with all those 10 countries and vice versa, not going is seen as somewhat dismissive. Now the Vietnamese won't mind because they're hosting the president in, in Hanoi, but otherwise it's disappointing. 
But ASEAN has really been very important in keeping the peace in Southeast Asia. Its ability to convene all the world's major leaders, that is the only institution that could do that because ASEAN isn't threatening to anybody so they can call everyone together and everyone will come. And also, again, this is a, this is a part of the world that's very dynamic economically, becoming more and more important economically. This is you know, looking out to the future as much as we can predict these things, this is going to become a more and more important region economically as well as strategically. And, you know, again, you don't go to the ASEAN meetings for the ASEAN meetings. You go to the ASEAN meetings because it's 10 countries in a really important region that matters a lot. Really interesting. Davey, what would you add to that from where, from where you sit in Jakarta? Yeah, uh, the, you know, the, President Biden has reiterated over and over again that ASEAN is at the heart of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. <laughs> you know, because the ASEAN region is really geographically at the heart of the Indo-Pacific. And it is the primary convener of all of the powers around the region. So when one say in on one hand, you know, ASEAN is at the center of the U.S. strategy, but then you're missing <laughs> this very important summit, mm -hmm. which is the host is the largest member of ASEAN. Uh, I find it a bit mind-boggling, you know, to put it in French. <laughs> it's, 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 it's so, I find it a bit strange, uh, put it that way. Okay, well, we have a number of questions uh, coming in here. This, again, is Pivotal States uh, with the Statecraft Program at the Carnegie Endowment. Um, delighted to be here with Ambassador Scott Marcial, former U.S. Ambassador to Indonesia and ASEAN, uh, and Professor Dewi Fortuna Anwar, uh, who is a research professor in Jakarta and former high-ranking uh, Indonesian government official. Um, Let's take this question right here, because I think this has come up, about the Just Energy Transition Partnership. Um, the, the question is specifically on whether or not uh, it will facilitate mineral cooperation between Indonesia and the U.S., uh, especially with regard to nickel. And Indonesia, of course, is one of the world's uh, largest um, reserves of nickel uh, and has been developing and putting nickel at the center of its economic strategy. Isn't, isn't that right, Scott? Yeah, absolutely. So, so what are the prospects for the Just Energy Transition Partnership as you see it? Well, the Just Energy Transition Partnership was an agreement between the, the G7, led by the U.S. and Japan, uh, plus, I think, Denmark and Norway, and Indonesia, where the, the G7 plus countries would agree to mobilize, with the private sector support, $20 billion. And Indonesia would agree to accelerate the transition from out of coal to cleaner energy. And... Um, it's that this was announced last November. Uh, Indonesia has working, been working on an investment plan to come up with specific projects that that would then lead to tapping the money. Um, I don't know how it's going to work out. There's a real question there. Uh, it's a huge opportunity for both uh, Indonesia and the U.S. as well as the rest of the G7 and actually globally to see if one of these partnerships can work. Indonesia has been complaining somewhat about the financing. They're, they're not happy with the amounts and, and how concessional or not it may be. Um, but it's, I think they're, both sides are still really working uh, to try to make this happen. So it's a wait and see thing for us. Now, linked to that is the critical minerals. The Just Energy Transition Partnership doesn't directly uh, go into the critical minerals, but related to that, Indonesia is trying to process nickel, go from an ex, uh, exporter of raw nickel to process nickel, and eventually to, to actually build electric vehicle batteries there. They have said, Indonesian officials have said that they would like to have a limited free trade agreement with the United States that would allow Indonesian processed nickel and maybe eventually batteries themselves to take advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act which gives a $7,500 tax credit. But on the critical minerals side of that, the critical minerals either have to come from the U.S. or from a country with a free trade agreement with the U.S. So Indonesia has broached that idea. Personally, I think it makes a lot of sense because the U.S. is trying to diversify, not rely totally on China. Um, but it, there's been no official movement on that yet. But I think it's a, it's a huge opportunity. 
Dewi, let me ask you the question uh, that's come up here about Indonesia's uh, possible role in doing more uh, on Myanmar. D do you think there's more that could be done um, at the current juncture? Well, uh, Indonesia's chair of ASEAN, uh, you know, uh, holds the uh, special envoy, unfortunately, is rotating now within ASEAN. Uh, that's another issue, you know. But, but the moment, uh, as you know, when the coup took place, Indonesia at the time, although the chairmanship of ASEAN was held by, by Brunei in 2021, it was Indonesia that initiated the meeting in Jakarta that also invited the hunter making it very clear that the invitation to the hunter was not a recognition of the hunter, but uh, making the hunter accept this five-point consensus uh, to end the conflict in Myanmar, uh, to end the violence, uh, to release the political prisoners, to, you know, to uh, ask the uh, hunter and the other uh, parties in Myanmar to have uh, uh, inclusive dialogue, and also to ensure that the hunter would allow access to uh, humanitarian assistance and also you know, the, uh, the appointment of an ASEAN envoy uh, to meet with all sides. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, internal conflicts must be decided by the people themselves. Uh, the U.S. Has, has a lot of experiences, you know, with all the U.S. military might and economic uh, uh, wealth and so on. You know, there's not, 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 not much could be done to bring lasting peace in Afghanistan, for example. Uh, in Myanmar, it's been on and off, you know, ASEAN and Indonesia also uh, played an active role in the earlier transition to democracy. Uh, Myanmar used to look to Indonesia, where the military also was very dominant in politics. You know, uh, they Indonesia at the time I was in, in fact also uh, quite actively involved uh, through various institutions and also personally. We said, you know, uh, just clean up your act a bit, uh, not to be so blatantly cruel, you know, and and, and violent. In Indonesia, the military uh, enjoyed international acceptance throughout the new order government uh, and uh, while enjoying power sharing while remaining dominant you know so they look at the indonesian model before 1998 where the military played a role in politics but now uh, it's i'm not sure whether myanmar still looks to indonesia uh, for a model because they probably see that indonesia has gone too democratic Maybe they look at the Thai model, where the military continues to uh, to to hold sway. But uh, I believe that ASEAN should play an active role uh, in trying to ensure that member states should comply with the principles that ASEAN itself has agreed upon. In the UN, uh, in the ASEAN Charter, it talks about. Uh, adherence to democracy, adherence to human uh, protect uh, human rights, rule of law, and constitutional change of government. And, and in any, and any organization should abide, you know, by the rules and should have the ability to enforce the rule. Unfortunately, ASEAN is not there yet. And I believe that uh, at the moment, ASEAN has made it possible to exclude the top leadership of Myanmar from attending ASEAN meetings. So despite the, the lack of an enforcement mechanism uh, in, in ASEAN, and despite this stress on consensus decision making, uh, the nine ASEAN countries have been able to make consensus excluding Myanmar. But I think that well, we need to go further than that. Uh, if Myanmar is serious about continuing its membership within an organization like ASEAN, uh, then I think it should also be, you know, uh, the, the, the hunter, uh, should think very deeply, you know, uh, whether it wants to continue to thumb its nose to the five-point consensus, which is you now, you know, the, uh, the the main starting point, the main platform for ASEAN. Myself, personally, I've always been very critical, uh, you know, of ASEAN's lack of enforcement mechanism. Scott, do you, do you agree that um, we are sort of at the limits of what could be realistically expected? Yeah. Well, um, I was also ambassador to Myanmar from 2016 to 2020. So I, um, I know a little bit about that situation. And, um, y you know, I, I think you can be critical of ASEAN for not being tougher vis-a-vis uh, -vis the junta. I think that's fair. And that's because it's split. It's divided. Uh, ASEAN is. Um, on the other hand, this junta, the generals who are leading this junta, uh, 
these are not people who compromise. They're absolutely brutal like nobody I've ever seen in my life. And so I don't think even the best diplomacy from ASEAN is not going to convince these guys to stop the violence against their people or surrender power. The only thing that has a hope of working is massive pressure. Um, ASEAN's done some on that front. I would like to see it do more, but it's unlikely because of the, of the split within ASEAN. There's a question here that I actually had been wanting to, to ask, which is turning towards the future, uh, how we think, uh, what we think the opportunities and risks are going to be in U.S.-Indonesia relations. Obviously, um, President Widodo is, is coming to the end of a, a long term uh, as the president of, of Indonesia in 2024. Um, and there are uh, a number of different contenders out there to take the reins of, uh, of state. I wonder, um, Dewi, from your perspective, we could start with you, if you could talk a little bit about um, how different outcomes in the presidential upcoming presidential election could affect these dynamics that we've been talking about, uh, the future of U.S.-Indonesian relations. Yeah, uh, because Indonesia has a clear doctrine, foreign policy doctrine, free and active foreign policy and, uh, you know, a non-alignment is very much in, a, uh, our, in our DNA. Uh, there's not much uh, of a sharp swing that you can expect you know, from the uh, Indonesia's foreign policy. Uh, we don't expect the kind of sharp swing that happened between from Sukarno to Suharto. Uh, there is the, uh, the, the kind of uh, strategic autonomy, uh, non-alignment meaning now, not, not being aligned to anybody, but also being in align multi-alignment, multi-engagements. Uh, so what Indonesia would like to do uh, is to engage with all countries uh, for our mutual benefits and to have more choices. Indonesia doesn't want to be boxed into one corner, for example, only having to become too dependent on China or too dependent on Japan or too dependent on the United States. So, you know, the, the most important thing is to have choices. So if the U.S. is concerned about China becoming too dominant, for example, economically, the, the uh, uh, panacea to that is to come with it's your own offers, you know, the, you know this, flesh out the IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, make it much more, uh, you know, clear, more concrete, uh, not uh, while talking about standards and governance is good, uh, people in the in my part of the world are also extreme, extremely materialistic. You know, they, are, they want to see the color of your money. You know, how much are you going to invest in what particular uh, areas? Um, the next presidents will continue to focus on uh, ensuring Indonesia's value-added economy. So uh, Scott talks about you know this protectionism. A lot of Indonesia has been criticized, for example. You know uh, that uh, in fact. A lot of countries are very upset that Indonesia is it's not exporting its raw materials uh, like nickel and so on. But I think all the Indonesian leaders in the future will want to continue uh, to Im improve the, the Indonesia's position in the global value chain by also having its uh, value-added industries here. And we'll want you know, to work with the industry of the future, you know, the digital economy, uh, this energy transition. And the U.S. is way ahead here. Uh, you know, it's proven technology in the, the U.S. has all the research uh, uh, capacity and, and all the technological know-how, you know, that, that is trusted. So we hope that, you know, the U.S. will play a big role again. And when it comes to the region, don't be so fixated on China and focus only on, on the military dimensions. Uh, because, again, you know, the uh, uh, people in Southeast Asia relate economic development to security. Because for right. most countries in the region, you know, a lot of our insecurity still comes from within. Uh, from right. the, Yeah, so from com communal conflicts, from regional grievances, and so on. Uh, so uh, de delivering economic development is still very much key to peace and stability. Essential. In, yeah. in many countries around the world that the United States is engaging with. Um, uh, Scott, do you, do you also see no, no big changes uh, in any of the presidential candidates or coming out of the presidential election next year? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think there could be some changes uh, if Prabowo Subianto is elected. There, there may be some change, but I agree with Dewi uh, that, you know, the the within certain parameters, and those parameters are, you know, non-aligned, free and active. Uh, so I, I wouldn't expect dramatic shifts. It would be more here and there. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think uh, for the future of the relationship, the security part of the relationship is now pretty good. It can always be better, but I think that could be pretty good. It's the economy focus on clean energy technology and also education. Our universities uh, are one of our greatest assets. <coughs> Excuse me. The number of Indonesians studying in the United States has been pretty stagnant for a while. I think we should be trying to get more Indonesians to study uh, here and uh, promoting these so-called you know, so people-to-people ties, uh, climate um, and clean energy and working with Indonesia in the minerals because Indonesia's got a lot of minerals that we don't have. It's got serious environmental issues with how a lot of those uh, minerals are being both mined and processed. So if we can make it, if we can work with Indonesia to make it attractive for higher quality investment in those areas, I think it's a win for Indonesia uh, for in terms of jobs and the environment, but also a win for us in terms of a, a, a verification of, of sources of key minerals. Well, we're coming to the end of our, our time here uh, on Pivotal States. Um, it's been a great discussion. I want to ask you a question that I like to ask uh, at the end of these sessions. Um, and that's that if you uh, were to sit down uh, with President Biden, um, what would be at the very top of your list? What would you put right there smack at the top? Um, Professor Anwar, let me ask you first. Well, I so, say, you know, treat Southeast Asia on its own merit, not as a derivative of the U.S. policy towards China. So don't really just come to, you know, to Southeast Asia when you're worried that another power is muscling in in your territory. But Southeast Asia doesn't want to be taken for granted. You know, it's a huge region. It's strategically important. It's huge population, economically dynamic. So, you know, uh, treat us with uh, consistency, uh, not parachute one time, too much attention at one time, and then disappearing for another moment. You know, nurture the relation in a more consistent manner. Fantastic. Ambassador Marcial? I'm smiling because what Dewey just said is, is at the, at the risk of, of plugging my own book, um, that's pretty much the conclusion of my book. Um, Southeast Asia is important in its own right. Deal with it consistently, not episodically, on its own merits. I mean, that's actually the best way. If you're worried about China, that's the best way to proceed. But it's also the best way to get a positive reception in the region. That's a fantastic place uh, to end. Uh, Ambassador Marcial, uh, Professor Anwar, thank you so much. It's been a great discussion. Uh, I look forward to continuing it in the future. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank, thank you. you.